Welcome everyone. We have Andrew, myself, Michael, John, Sean, Jan, Mark, and Antrenig, and we will probably have others dropping in. This podcast is brought to you by those exact same people because this is a volunteer effort with nothing financially attached to it, and I consider it priceless. Uh, we have a few new faces. We have Sean, who is a regular on the Hambug calls, the Hamilton area ESD user group calls. And Sean, you have a different issue than the one you mentioned on those calls. What you got? Oh, okay. Um, it's uh, something I actually posted on the FreeBSD virtualization list about, which is that um, some Ubuntu, in fact, all the Ubuntu guests that I have running on uh, Beehive, um, the Beehive I'm using is via TrueNAS, uh, the latest version. Um, and often one of them seizes up uh, where I can't SSH. Uh, and then after a couple of minutes, it'll come alive again. And this will repeat. Um, and in the Ubuntu logs, I see messages um, about things like um, timekeeping watchdog on CPU to marking clock source as unstable because the skew is too large um, and various other clock source watchdog type things, which kind of sound to me like they might be beehive bugs, but they could just as well be Ubuntu bugs. I, I don't know. Um, Do you have that link that you posted to the forums? Or uh, list, rather? Yes. Um, and in theory, it's in the list it, archive. Yeah, I can find that in cool. a couple of seconds. I don't have it right now. Sure, and that's a general ground rule. Try to have your list links ready because usually it's really neat stuff. Ah, uh, sorry about that. Oh no, no worries at all. Um, it was on June fifteenth. Oh. Uh, yeah, so I'll bring that open and we'll all take a look at it. Um, let's see. I know Chuck has been working on some time. Keeping issues. Uh, can you try B5? Okay, I have the link. <clears throat> yeah, I know Chuck Duffley was hitting what might be the same issue. So that's why I want to just get us all on the same page. Uh, boom, thank you very much for that. I will drop it in the doc, copy, boom. Uh, vert list, okay. Now you mentioned they slow down and come back. Does that mean you get out of the woods on that or unfortunately it brings down a guest permanently? Um. It's, it's pretty bad, like it, it kind of comes back alive, but then it freezes up again. And we usually don't leave it to be screwed up like that. We just reboot the guest. Okay. I'm running since 13 core. Do you run NTP or are you relying on host time? Uh, yes, I run NTP. Someone had answered this thread um, about NTP. And so I run NTP on my LAN on a PFSense and both the both the TrueNAS and the guest are pointing to to that NTP server. And you said that's on the LAN. Yeah. Cool. Which clock source so, the HPAT? That does sound familiar to me. Um, that's the uh, HCPI high performance event timer. I recall some thought about the developers meetings had discussed that for Windows specifically in Beehive, but I wasn't sure if that was applying to Omni or Solaris based uh, Beehive or if it was FreeBSD's branches. Um, I believe it. it the, the stuff that was discussed applied to both. And it's, um, at least in the Windows environment, what we were seeing was it not Windows not doing a good job as a guest OS, deciding what it wanted to get its time from. Because of course, even on a real physical machine, you have multiple 
sources of time that you can talk about, you know, that you can use. Okay, so I'll leave that there. Let's look at the thread. I see Jump Tubner dropped right in as a response. Yep, reliable time source. Do, 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 do. Go to. And was that the only response you got? I'm seeing no go to top of page archives. Okay, no. Yeah, that was the only one. Okay. Um, and it sounds like John on the call concurs. That said, uh, have you tried to configure Linux to use the TSC only? Could you repeat that? I believe he said, "Can you can, have you tried configuring Linux to use only the TSC?" No, I have not. I don't actually really know what you mean by yeah. that or how to. Do how that. would one do that, Jan? I know how to do it on FreeBSD, but not on uh, Linux. Or so I can, I can with Google that. Vitaly's work, I did document the clock selection. And so I can dig that up and then find the um, equivalence in Linux. So let's each see what we can find on that. I'll make a note to myself here, find TSC and hopefully uh, Chuck can jump in. He was having very much a similar issue, perhaps an identical issue. So, okay, we've got the basics documented. Thank you very much for posting the list and getting it documented there. Uh, we'll, let's see who trickles in, but I've got my own action items on that as do others. So that said, uh, anything else, Sean, or do you wanna briefly describe the issue you described on the Hambug calls? Um, for this clock thing, yeah, that's good. Thanks for the information. Um, uh, for the Hambug call, I mean, that was like a year ago with an older version of Beehive on an older version of uh, TrueNAS, I think based on FreeBSD 12. Um, I did a port scan of the, of the, of the TrueNAS and it, as I recall, it caused all the guests to, to die. Um, but I have yet to try and reproduce that on the current uh, TrueNAS, which I think I will try this week because there's a update to TrueNAS, so I have to reboot the thing anyway. So it's kind of a good time to take a chance and, and reproduce it. Yeah, it was the uh, port scan taking down, was it only VMs or also the host? Just the, just the guest VMs. Okay. Yeah, that was a head scratcher at the time. And uh, hopefully you get some insights into that. Uh, uh, do you ever interact with Patrick in Germany, uh, Hausen? He's been very active on the forums regarding Beehive under TrueNAS. Don't believe so, but the name okay. sounds kind of familiar. I wonder if he's on the, I think I might've seen his name on the TrueNAS forum. Yeah, that would, would be a great place to find him and feel free to reach out um, both directly, port scanning, port scanning. Um, he's one of the go-to people on that. So, hey, great resource and he's been lobbying for better bridges, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, on Somebody TrueNAS else on the TrueNAS forum experienced the same bug here that I'm talking about. Uh, but there wasn't really any resolution on that form. Uh, do you have that link, if handy? Drop it in. Let's just get all this documented. Um, yeah, it's in. It's in the my post to the oh. to the list. All right. Um, but I will uh, also fetch it. Oh, dear. that's a different one. Do 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 do. Oh yes, you did. Good man. I missed it. Uh, yep. Great. And it sounds like Mark might have some news here. Uh, Just quickly using Google Foo, I found some places where you might be able to modify the TSC in regards to further that part of your, your investigation. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll definitely try that.
Okay. Uh, I'm dropping in that link. And thank you, Mark, for that. Let's take a peek together. Uh, bugs got lands from this. Okay. And if you're tactical, just drop things straight in the dock and I'll format them. This is for everyone. There is right. that. Um, bug got in going to. Let's take a look. Ah, their devices clock. Re oh, great, nice find. Let's take a look together. The default clock source, there you go. Yep, and I happen to need TSC. Excellent, good find. Uh, Sean, I'll leave that to the reader right now, but that's sort of documented here. And I will also drop that to Chuck, who might be in the exact same boat. Okay, excellent, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, now, Mark, while we have you, do you have any news on your vagrant work? I unfortunately do not have any news. Um, I've been using it pretty much every every other day whenever I need to spin up new VMs or rebuild a Vagrant machine. Um, so my current version, it, it seems to work how we need it here, uh, here for my, my job. But um, Excellent. Yeah, I haven't I've been able to do much development work to it. Uh, I do plan on, we have a, a, an internal script that's working between VirtualBox and Beehive. So I have to have it kind of spin up Vagrant in both. So I've, I've been working on interoperability between the two. So the actual provisioning scripts for the VMs, not actual spinning up the the whole, like making it uh, the bigger part work on it on Beehive. So okay. not not much development work, but hopefully soon I can get back to it. Cool. Uh, if the link is handy for that, for the benefit of others, yep. drop it in. If not, that's okay. It's, it's in the docs and you've definitely covered that. And I thank you for that. And I should have it on the top of my head, but uh, I don't. Um, I just gotta pull up the doc, not drop it right in. Cool, awesome. Um, John, you have some rather impressive Ampere hardware coming and you asked about ARM64 support and I responded, hey, we haven't heard much since even uh, Asia BSD con, but tell us, tell us exactly what you want to achieve with that and see with that. Um, I would state the goal here is uh, running a large number of uh, small systems to emulate uh, endpoints. Okay. Uh, uh, describe what type of endpoint that rep that simulates. Um, your your various endpoints that you can gather data from, um, and. This is, they'll, they'll have data fed into them, um, at which point the stuff is brought back. It's, this is, sorry, this is product level stuff we're getting into. Um, no worries, no worries. Um, uh, make it vague, as vague as necessary. <laughs> so, you know, we're looking at emulating a large number of these endpoints. The endpoints have data uh, fed in, and it, yes, it's simulated. Um, and then that data gets fed up to a, a gatherer, uh, and every you know everything gets munged down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And is the current endpoint based on ARM, and that's where it would yeah. help you to have yeah, exactly. Okay, I hear you. Okay, are you doing that currently in QEMU or something else? Uh, yes. We actually, I think, have a. Uh, I, I, I actually, I am not doing this currently. Somebody else is. Um, I believe there is a either unsupported or early access um, uh, VMware ARM emulation Indeed. system. Correct. Uh, um, I'm using Raspberry Pi and EXXI currently as my replacements for yeah, x86, EXXI. So I have a little bit of familiar with VMware, but I would love to have Beehive on ARM and um, Raspberry Pi would be even better. Yeah. Uh, how much RAM is on your Raspberry Pi? I have the eight gigabyte uh, Raspberry yeah. 4 Pi model. That's what uh, they talk about. Yeah, I think so. Um, I haven't seen a 16 gig before. 
Um, okay. I worked on CM4 models and the uh, standard uh, form factor. And that's a Raspberry Pi 4, I take it? Yep. Okay. Uh, cool. Yeah, it, that's a fascinating one. Uh, I can pull up a link and if uh, that Yeah, sure, drop that in. Because on, I can see how on an Ampere with 128 gigs of RAM, that is uh, remarkable on a limited RAM machine. Well, you don't have a lot of leg room. Um, you drop in that, and has it stabilized, for lack of a better term, VMware on, on ARM? I haven't followed their larger footprint for the, like the, I haven't, I know that they probably have, I, I haven't followed much up on other than running that's on the X and the Raspberry Pi. So no, that's cool. At least for ARM. Um, I'm curious, does it run on the Microsoft development machine? Does it run on Soul Thunder X? Does it work, you know, on all the things? I had all the things I would probably have tried by now. <laughs> cool. So yeah. Um, Yes, uh, uh, John, do you have any questions for Mark who's using it on those platforms? Um, so he is using QEMU. Is that is is that I believe is what he said? Is that correct? Well, well it's XSI on the Raspberry Pi. Um, so yes. whatever their proprietary engine is, if it's based on QEMU, then yes. Yeah, I don't actually know what their proprietary engine is. I um, think it's homegrown and it's one of the oldest around, is it not? It's their own, yes. Okay. Yeah, I don't yeah. know what's the core of its cult, I guess just the VMware engine. But yeah. Okay. Well, I was asked to look into this to see if I could do it without using VMware. And um, I know it can be done with QEMU. Um, and I was hoping that I might be able to pop FreeBSD on there. I know that there are some patches out there, but I hate to run a um, production level system on a set of patches like that. You don't want to be a release engineer? <laughs> ha, 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 ha. <laughs> That's a run, long running topic. Uh, I have found the link for ESXi ARM edition, I believe they call it, and I'll put a link in the notes there, but it's a fascinating one. It's it's interesting that the discussion is shifting to, well, a meaningful discussion on another platform. Uh, I will <laughs> do my best to nudge around and find out if uh, Andy has made progress on that. I know there have been just housekeeping patches to just prepare for it being a thing, but that's also a perfect segue to what's at the top of the dock. Uh, the uh, Glenn Barber, the FreeBSD release engineer who happens to be looking for funding for his work, announced an updated schedule for the 14 release. Ah, thanks for dropping that in. I'm waiting for it to at least let me in there. You have posted a Raspberry Pi how-to. Excellent. Thank you for that. Yeah, just more or less uh, how I went through it so anybody can try perfect. it. And I perfect. even got it working over iSCSI. I think I had the disk working from remote NOS, to NOS uh, share. So. Oh, nice. Okay. You mean you found your storage limited on your Raspberry Pi? <laughs> I did. I actually wanted to limit the rights on that. I wanted to limit the rights on that, on that fragile SD card. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Uh, right. How to. Okay. So that said, I will... Not, not that I've, I'm going to consider it great because it exists. So I'll drop that in. There we go. Sorry to bring Beamer into a Beehive meeting, but it's as close hey, as I can get to running Beehive. Operating on in a vacuum is never helpful. We should know exactly what they're doing. And I'm happy to talk about Proxmox. It does some things really well, and some things are concerning, especially what might be... Uh, ba, 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 ba. Oh, Jan points out that the... Windows development kit I mentioned, which is like 600 bucks, not too crazy, doesn't allow access for the hypervisor. Hopefully the little button we can knob we can flip. So just briefly on a related point, uh, the delays in the FreeBSD 14 release schedule could in fact be very good for Andy's ARM64 work. So it's an opportunity for those who are interested to just 
politely inquire and nudge because if we could have uh, Beehive as a feature of FreeBSD 14, that would be spectacular. Thank you very much. So thank you very, very much for bringing that up. Um, also along those lines, I suppose it's my fiduciary duty to say, hey, I don't have all the backstory, but I know Glenn was working for the foundation. He then worked for uh, NetGate, who the producers of PFSense as simultaneously their release engineer. And he's now, because it's a unique position, hoping to do that independently. So he has set up a fundraising campaign and I will chuck that in the doc, just that's again, part of my fiduciary duty. So if anyone's able to help him out, there is that. It's slowly loading. Related to release engineering, Glenn Barber has produced the funding. So there's that. Okay, um, if we were to identify and resolve the clock cycles alone, uh, time counters alone and get ARM in 14, that would be everything I could hope for from a call like this. But let's discuss other topics. Um, Antrenig, on the recent jail calls, there was some excellent coverage on, say, CPU pinning, process pinning. And thank you, John, for sharing your syntax to pin, oh, network interface IRQs to CPU cores, which is pretty impressive. It, uh, yep. But everyone, are there pinning topics we want to discuss related specifically to Beehive? Uh, does anybody know specifically why using the newer MVME uh, disk controller would cause Windows to BSD versus using Verdeo or the AHCI driver not doing that? Oh, do tell. What exactly are you seeing? Um, so, so, so for the past um, month, it's been stable, but for a few months there, every couple of days, we have a server, a Windows 2022 server um, that was set up on just a standard like 60 gigabyte Zvol volume on Beehive. On a, on a triple mirror array, um, it would just crash blue screen if we caught it. Otherwise, it would just turn off after a certain amount of time and the zone, just, it wouldn't automatically reboot it. Um, that, that's kind of expected in, during a crash. So, but it, that's the, not the issue is it not rebooting. The issue is it crashing in the first place. And if we do catch it, it seems to be a blue screen. And I believe it's an issue. Uh, it, it, I haven't seen the blue screen in a couple of weeks, but it's a STIO error, so send it in and out. So I'm assuming it's a disk read write issue. But whenever we run it, ran it on Vert.io, they're using the Vert.io uh, driver, at least on the OmniOS Solaris branches of the Beehive systems, I am getting blue screens. I, I don't know much more what to debug in that, um, okay. but I can't say it's stable. So Vert.io is stable, but the NVMe driver is not. Correct. And I think, I don't know if it's a driver or if it's more of a tr controller that it exposes to it. Interesting. Uh, interface. Okay. That's the word interface. That's what it, the man talks say. Okay. So the NVMe interface? Mm. Okay. I'll, I'll, uh, I'm uh, George, are you passing an NVMe the controller into the VM? No. We're just okay. using the disk controller as a, as a, as a, so. Uh, as people know, Vert.io isn't necessarily included in the drivers that Windows allows on boot. So if you have a trying to install on KVM or other machines, you have to slipstream the Vert.io driver or have the Vert.io ISO mounted at the same time, then load it into the machine before you can actually install Windows in those types of setups. If you use the HCI or the, the very old disk driver, you don't have that issue. And I believe MVME just recently came out in OmniOS R36. I'm not sure if it's in FreeBSD yet, but I'm pretty sure it is at some yeah, yep. in some package release version. Um, but the NVMe driver it is it supposed to be faster, and you didn't need to slipstream the Vertio drivers. That was one of the biggest appeals to a de DevOps person was you didn't need to add extra drivers to get the thing to work. Yep. Um, so I switched over to it, and we've seen it have issues since. Uh, only on this one VM though. So. Um. Okay, so that is, by most accounts, the go-to way of, of giving disk access on a Windows VM. So it's Windows Server 2022. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how many other 22 servers are you running if only this one is giving you trouble? 
sorry, this is the only vert, uh, NVMe one that we're running right now. We're running all okay. the other ones on their vert IO because we have our base template with the okay. driver already included. So we didn't want to use that on production. Okay. And it's uh, like 40 or 50 VMs or so that are running on vert IO just fine. Just fine. Um, interesting. It, do, uh, do you have any either blue screens or the memory dump or others that you can offer? So I don't uh, have the, I don't have quickly available the blue screen. I wasn't necessarily ready to present this exact issue at the moment, okay. um, but I, I can still get the uh, on the US man pages for the disk interface and how I'm selecting that at the beehive level. Oh yeah. I'm not worried about that. Uh, what okay. record size are you handing over to uh, Windows? Uh, the default that is on OmniOS R30 and above is 8K. Is that what you're asking, the block size? Yes, yeah, that's exactly what I'm asking. Uh, you probably want to punch that up to 16 or 32. Uh, okay. One, Jim Salter has been very vocal about that, about Proxmox using not that. However, they're using the ZFS defaults, which are soon to be bumped to 16 at some point. And I will dig up a link for you on Blue Sky screen and core dump anal analysis. Just one sec. So that means in the quickest way to fix that would probably to bring the machine offline to a ZFS in and receive, but to a different ZVOL size or block size. I, uh, I guess probably, in that case, uh, it's the what record size of the ZVOL. Right. If I'm not mistaken. So and, but you, you couldn't just change that in the ZVOL settings. You would have to convert no, the ZVOL to No, it would probably be very unhappy. Correct. Uh, you, uh, you could create a second one. Uh, the send should, I believe, respect the change and off we go. So I've found the link to share just one moment. Um, I really wish I didn't know this, but I know this from ZFS on Windows. Here, I'll drop it in chat. This is how we who never have used Windows professionally in our lives uh, can find and uh, analyze crash dumps. Uh, so if you have that memory DMP file, which I hope is the same on server, go ahead and run these steps. You need the certain little tools to obtain that information and then you'll get essentially the key stack information, et cetera. So let me drop that in there. Boop, boop. Um, I uh, note this on Windows crash dump. Okay, thank you for that manual page on your disk information. Oh, I like the hashtag to get mm -hmm. like a, well, an anchor they, to get they, there. They, nice. I really, I'm really liking Omnios's recent update to their man pages. It's it's pretty pretty nifty. Oh, that's fantastic. Um. Are there any other options being specified to the NVMe emulation on nope. the Beehive command line? I'm just specifying the controller. And then it's using the underlying ZVOL as the uh, disk data set. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, and any other ZFS user, can you confirm that the send would should respect going from 8K to 32K and just do the housekeeping? If it doesn't, I know I can use Q QEMU uh, image to convert it from 4K to 8K. I've already done that test before, but I wasn't sure if there's a native ZFS oh. way to do that. Are you using ZVOLs or? ZVOLs. Uh, oh, okay. yeah. Well, then that's where, I don't know, QME. I, I would just, help you. it can. I just have to specify raw. Fine, fine. Okay, so but it that. seems weird doing it via QME instead of a native ZFS tool to do that, which I think there probably is. Okay. I just haven't been exposed to it. Hey. Um, that is a key one. And, uh, let me see. I will nudge our resident windows expert whose time zone issues can't get him on the calls. Jason, see if he's uh, been running 22. Oh, STIO. Thank you for correcting that. Um, Jason, uh, any chance you're... Is anyone else running Windows Server 2022 as a guest? Okay, so yeah, um, that said, consider the other record size and uh, you've got the crash dump analysis link. Uh, I, right now. 
go for it. And for those who just occasionally are forced to sit down at a a Windows machine, the it, you, you, during that blue or possibly now green screen, you get a uh, clock timing. You get a big old dumping out the file and you'll find at the top of Windows me memory dump and WinDBG, which has been outside of Microsoft for some time and is kind of sort of integrated to their development tool environment is available. Uh, there are various ways to select the file through the GUI, but I found that it's easiest just to fire this off and then drop it into Notepad, get that out to some other system and get it in front of the developers. So this was specific to the ZFS, ZFS on, on Windows. Windows, but hey, it's file systems versus file systems versus file systems. So anyway, I hope that's helpful to you. And I, I work with Jorgen to bring that those docs up to date because of course he's not a Windows guy. I'm not a Windows guy, but we need to make this stuff work on Windows. Right. Uh, Much appreciated. So, Thank you for that. That's a good link. Hey, my pleasure. Uh, <laughs> again, I wish I didn't know that, but I know that. Uh, using 8K uh, record size. Recommended Ball block size, sorry. Uh, Ball block. Like ball block. Yeah, uh, 16 or 32. Consider 16K or 32K, especially for any you know, VM usage that maps as basic, basically the best uh, practices. So there are three great topics we've covered in one hour. You said anything else? Go ahead. Andrew. I was going to say, you said somebody had a rant about the uh, 16 or 32K. Is there a link to that oh, somewhere? Yes, absolutely. Give me just a sec to find that. Uh, ba -ba -ba. I will bring that up in another window for a sec. And, and I heard the rant prior to spending time with Proxmox. And then it's like, well, uh, JRSS net. Uh, they're using the default that they're as a project new to ZFS. So it's like, well, why isn't ZFS giving us a good default? Hmm. <laughs> Is it their fault? Not sure. Uh, Proxmox ZFS. Okay, just one moment. Yeah, the philosophy behind everything when um, Sun existed was supposed to be your default is sane. Amen. So if it's not giving a good default, that's a problem. Yes. And 15 times out on OpenBSD, where it's like, nope, we really want to get you going in the right way off the bat rather than turning knobs. Okay. I think I found it. Give me just a sec on that. Um, yeah. Thank and you. Same defaults, it's like, well, uh, what's the phrase of the week? Do not compile downstream. Thank you, Red Hat. What? <laughs> we can maybe have to late in the call. We can talk about the, the politics of the week with Red Hat and friends, but whatever. That's why we're doing what we're having this call for that reason, to give alternatives to the madness. Uh, uh, for those who haven't heard these headlines, Red Hat had is, is further tightening its availability of sources for its enterprise product, which may or may not harm Alma and uh, Rocky. Rocky. But and also have, Oracle. Technically Oracle, yes. And Oracle's like ironically almost a better but player. They haven't said anything. <laughs> really? Okay. They haven't said a single blog post. They haven't had a PR plus about it. I think they're mounting up for something. Okay. That sounds like a good way to get sued. For them not to say anything? No, no, for the t tightening up on their, their source access. They have to be careful with that, and they need to run it past a bunch of lawyers or something. somebody like the uh, um, oh, what is it? Well, there's a Free Software Foundation, but there's the other one that's a bit more litigious. IFF or something? No. Oh, Conservancy? Uh, if you're talking about GM... GPL enforcement, um, Software Freedom Conser Conservancy has issued a, a statement on 
the latest out of Red Hat. That could be them. I know. Oh, I, yeah. I I know a lawyer there, actually. Karen Sandler. Wait, what? Oh no. Or, uh, Software Freedom Law Center, perhaps. That's not um, kind of, he's, he's working. Any he, he's he, well. He he he's a new lawyer. He 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 actually just passed the bar. He's been there as an intern during his thing. And uh, cool. Yeah, S- S- SFC. That's it. But okay. They were the Wait. one. They were the ones behind the uh, the recent lawsuits involving BusyBox, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. That's the one. Oh, cool. Oh, no. Oh, we can have that conversation separately. There. So uh, let me announce: Fossey.us conference is coming to Portland in a few weeks, which is an alternative to OzCon, which eroded away just like so many things. Uh, and I found that rant, I've dropped it in the chat and I'm slowly putting it in the dock. Um, I will probably steal my daughter's new computer while she's gone and have a faster experience. So I'm so sorry about that uh, choice, which happens to be the default. Um, so Fossey's coming up and out of all this Red Hat stuff, they've had some wonderful quotations about how people shouldn't be, what is it, downstream compiling? It's like, um, isn't Red Hat Linux basically a diff of countless upstream components? I'm not feeling it. Uh, they uh, had a response to the to to the to the backlash at large. There's a, another follow up blog post if you haven't caught that from Mike, them in. Mike McGrath. Yeah. Okay, yeah. The, well, I'm posting this. Drop them in the chat. We'll the, uh, collectively look at them. The license they're using says the polar opposite, and I don't care which one you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, as a data center person, it kind of instances me a bit. And just it's annoying. Uh, so yeah, uh, here's the rant. And uh, as was it Antonig with you or with uh, Daniel? It's like free, as in free to take it away from you whenever they please. It's like ah, not the software freedom we're after, guys. And girl, you right. wouldn't steal a source code. I, on the other hand, would steal a, would print out a car. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, Antronig, share your quotation Do you from want that me? Okay. event, that Microsoft sure. event yesterday while, sure. while we get these sure. links on the rants. Go, I please. Okay. So I, I, I was not at the event myself because at the time I would be like eight years old or something. Uh, so this story has been passed to me from my mentor. And the following is Microsoft comes to here, Armenia, in the year 2003 because they're releasing the new software, which is Microsoft Server version 2003. Uh, and um, what happened is, uh, what happened is, Armenia, according to Microsoft statistics, had the highest percentage of cracked Windowses, because apparently they can figure out a statistics, a statistics and stuff. So they can, like the, the, uh, we were like ninety nine point something. All of Windows desktops and servers they were all cracked. None of them were licensed, because you know we're post Soviet country. We don't like to pay for things that we cannot touch. And obviously, with that whole uh, you. Uh, you, you should not steal uh, propaganda. Someone on the stage said, "Well, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't steal, a, you shouldn't steal a car, and just like that, you shouldn't steal software." And apparently, someone from the audience, from the back, shouted, "Can I buy used software?" And and you know, it's it's a very typical scenario of you know, because no one here buys new cars, everyone buys a used car. So you know, the idea was can we buy used software for a lot cheaper? And and that's that's that that story kind of stuck on with, with sysadmins in in here. And so now they have like a symbiotic relationship with organizations. Organizations don't want to pay money for licenses, and sysadmins just crack the licenses for organizations. Hence, we we end up in a world like this. But yeah, I think I think I think the, the Red Hat stories are, are funny. And we were talking with Michael yesterday. They have this website called what was it? Opensource.com. Oh, opensource.com. Opensource.com. Like, com. Hey, we're you know we're community players. We are we're here. We're your friends. It's like and uh, and on the website, there's a place that says like alternative to Adobe Photoshop, alternative to 
uh, I don't know, some random Windows software. And, you know, there's a list of alternatives in there. And we were thinking maybe we should write an article because anyone can write an article there apparently, which says, you know, alternatives to Red Hat. And now we can, you know, <laughs> tell people <laughs> what, what they can do better than that. So, yeah. Well, that particular um, campaign here was worded a little bit differently. It was something like you wouldn't copy a car. And my answer was always, yes, actually, I would happily copy a car. Why would I not copy a car? absurdity okay so i found the small challenge the blog post from this from conservancy is going directly to the article so that whenever they post their next post it will be pushed off the stack so let me see if there's a way to get an anchor link to it just like those on the os manual pages you showed which is awesome oh permalink here we go boom plus their hearts they put in a permalink just like those pages thank you Boom, here we go. Okay, I'll give you the, in the chat and in the doc. So Red Hat comments, uh, SFC comments. And yeah, I, yeah. I, people are shocked that, you know, like, oh no, Oracle might be or not be like Oracle. Well, no, they're probably going to be pretty consistent over the decades on their love of your freedom. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, well, we, if you have any other links relating to that topic, great. Go ahead, Hat. John. Go ahead. We know who runs Red Hat now. Blue Hat. <clears throat> yes. IBM Hat. No, it's like, well. If anybody's worked on that hardware software in the past, you, you, understand, you understand they have a very particular view on licensing. Yeah. Okay. Those have been some fantastic topics. Any others while we're at it? Or shall we just push through on them? The Windows uh, NVMe issues, the time counter issues, and hopefully previous E14 with Beehive as a top tier supported hypervisor on ARM. Okay, well, uh, how about we call it? I can be around for a little while and uh, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you. Thank you, that was awesome.